Good evening, afternoon, or morning to our very esteemed speakers and guests. I'm Khenzak Ken, and it is my honor to welcome you on behalf of UNIDIR Gender and Disarmament Program and the Middle East Weapon of Mass Destruction Free Zone Project to today's meeting, Advancing the Role of Women in International Security, Views from the Middle East. I will also like to thank you and women our event co-organizer and congratulate Ambassador Sima Bahus of Jordan for her recent nomination as Executive Director of UN Women. The meeting is part of a broader UNIDIR initiative aim at understanding the obstacle of that preventing women equal participation and think together on ways to overcome those. UNIDIR has several workshops in various regions and this particular event is looking on the Middle East in general and Arabic speaking countries in particular to raise awareness of the importance of promoting the role of women in the fields of international security, especially in senior and decision-making roles and identify the means in which this can be achieved. We are fortunate to have today five women from the Middle East that embodied just that. I cannot think of a better group of women that can serve as role models and help us think through these issues. We are aware that the Middle East also contain non-Arabic speaking countries and many of the obstacles as well as the solution that we will discuss today are relevant beyond the Middle East. We wanted to start on a small scale and expand our efforts. So we see it really as the beginning, not the end. Before we start, let me go through some logistical and technical issues. If you have any technical issues, please contact by email Letitia, our event facilitator, or either to Misha, and one of them will add uh, their email in the chat box. On the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a globe. Please choose one language, either Arabic or English. The event is going to interpret it simultaneously today to Arabic and English. Speaker in the event may speak either English or Arabic. As a participant, you don't need to do anything. Uh, you will hear throughout the event your chosen language. Uh, we will also want to share with you a fact sheet. Unity produced uh, based on a research and the roundtables that we held with women in the region. The link will be available in the chat as well. We have a great event today with excellent speakers. So Ambassador Lina El Hadid of Jordan will deliver opening remarks, followed by a moderated discussion with Mina al editor-in-chief of The National, Ambassador Nabil al Mula of Kuwait, Ambassador Lana Nuseiba of the UAE, and Ms. Mona Halil, Director of MAC Law and former Senior Legal Officer with the UN and the IEA. Following the panel, we will have the pleasure of welcoming Assistant Secretary General and Deputy Executive Director of UN Women, Anita Bathaya, to deliver remarks, following by closing remark from UNIDIR Director, Dr. Robin Kess. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce Ambassador Lina El Hadid who is ambassador of Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan to the Republic of Austria, non-resident ambassador to Czech Republic and the Republic of Hungary, permanent representative of Jordan to the, EU, to the UN and other international organizations, and the OSCE in Vienna, Austria. She was chairperson of the Board of Governors of the IEA between 2018 and 19, and a member of the Mediterranean Women Mediators Network. And especially dear to us, She's also a member of the advisory board on disarmament matters and the BOT of UNIDIR. Ambassador El Hadid, welcome, and the floor is yours. In order to discuss the possibilities of promoting the participation of women in ensuring international security, it's important to highlight the contributions of Arab women. Hopefully, through this discussion, we will be able to determine certain uh, practical measure is not only to promote the participation of women, but also to provide for an enabling environment in order to make women more successful in promoting international security and in reaching um, fruitful development for uh, societies locally and internationally. In order to highlight the contribution of women to international security, we need to be serious in tackling some relevant issues and to address a number of questions. Before that, I would like to call on to everyone to consult the different publications that are issued in this regard, especially those issued by the Institute for Research on Disarmament, UNIDIR, and that it has thankfully translated into Arabic last year, namely uh, the publications on uh, connecting the dots. In order to guide our discussion, I would like to start with these questions. Do you think that uh, in our different policies that exist in the Arab world, do we really emphasize the issue of uh, 
uh, gender equality, in my opinion, in an Arab society, is we do have a certain level of commitment, but it needs to be modernized and uh, uh, developed. And allow me here to share with you a few examples in English. 25 and its numerous subsequent resolution on women, peace and security were not drafted and later adopted out of a void, but rather grounded in international human rights law, legal instruments such as CEDAW and other relevant internationally agreed frameworks. The Women, Peace and Security Agenda centers around four pillars, but the true challenge lies in that it's a huge area to cover and it branches out in directions and areas that cannot always be adequately addressed. Regardless, in recent years, the Arab world has witnessed an acceleration in the implementation of that agenda. Efforts have intensified to design and implement national action plans. Discussions have been advancing nationally, regionally, and internationally. I think this side event being a perfect example of that effort. Let me focus a little bit at the regional level and bring you to the League of Arab States. In 2015, a regional strategy and plan of action was prepared to adapt the International Women, Peace and Security Agenda regionally and to serve as an umbrella for Arab countries. In 2017, Jordan adopted a national action plan and has been actively pursuing its goals since. That plan was de developed to respond to the country's latest security and military challenges. It is no secret that international security and disarmament diplomacy are fields usually dominated by men. However, this trend has been changing globally, including in the Middle East. The recruitment of women into the army is becoming a subject of increasing discussion in the Arab world and several countries have made significant efforts to bring women into their armed forces. The Jordanian armed forces developed a strategy for women that aims to build capacity through recruitment and training, generating broader participation and employment opportunities. There are now around 5,000 female personnel in uniform, which represents around 3% of all the country's military forces. It's not a big percentage, but steady, and it has been steady for decades, thus changing perceptions in communities. Women now have access to the Air Force, Military Force, Royal Guard Protection Unit, and military intelligence. Several reach the ranks of Brigadier General in the Armed Forces and Major General in the Royal Medical Services. These are huge achievements. Jordanian women joined the UN peacekeeping forces in 2007. They participated in many countries such as Congo, Cyprus, South Sudan, Fiji, Afghanistan, and carried out duties with refugees and were involved in training local police forces in various countries. They also took part in the Gaza field hospital as medical staff. One of the examples of Arab and regional cooperation would be the recent agreement between my government and that of the state of Qatar in sending female security personnel to the 2022 World Cup. One example of international institutions focusing on gender parity would be the International Atomic Energy Agency, which strives to increase the representation of women both in the nuclear field as scientists and in the secretariat. I myself can remember during my post here in Vienna in the 90s, when attending meetings of the IAEA, only few women participated then. Currently, there are so many women in decision-making and senior positions, including around 30% of female ambassadors in the room. In the IAEA secretariat, I'm proud to say that we have one female inspector, a Jordanian female inspector who travels around the world inspecting nuclear facilities. During my time as a chairperson of the Board of Governors of the IEA for the year 2018 and 2019, I found myself resolving complex negotiations that I would not have been able to sail through had I not accumulated years of experience in diplomacy. A number of female ambassadors, Jordanian ambassadors, are now holding sensitive positions around the world, and the new and upcoming generation holds so much promise for the future. Despite all the progress made in increasing the number of women in the field of international security and disarmament, gender parity is still a long way to go. 
To go back to numbers, the World Economic Forum report in 2020 estimates that gender gaps in the Middle East and North Africa could potentially be closed by around 100 years. Now, that's a long time to wait. The Arab region has the world's lowest rate of female labor force participation and female unemployment is three times higher than the world average. These numbers are disturbing given that more than half of the Arab population is below the age of 30. In Jordan, we identified this challenge early on and spearheaded efforts at the UN Security Council, which led to the adoption of the historic UN Security Council 2250 on youth peace and security. It was the first time in history that the focus was entirely on the role of young men and women in peace building and countering violent extremism. Arguments for promoting gender parity tend to resolve around social, political, or religious reasons. While there may be valid justification in some areas, in other areas, they are often too abstract. After all, the majority of, uh, in the majority of Arab countries, the gender gap in education favors women in university level, outnumbering men by 30%. The number of female graduates in science in, is higher than that of males in 11 of the Arab countries. More effort needs to be made to involve these graduates and to remove obstacles that may stem from gender stereotypes and social cultural expectations. These are, there is a huge untapped potential and it is too costly for our societies to move towards, to, not to move towards a higher level of inclusion. Studies have shown that women are more inclined to understand security problems, tend to support preventive measures, and are less inclined to repressive solutions. I am not trying to argue whether women or, and men think differently, but rather that having that diversity of opinions within our societies can only strengthen professions and disciplines. Evidence has suggested that it, including women in conflict mediation has a positive impact on the durability of peace. At the end of the day, having a similar attitude or approach toward any issue will never lead to robust deb debates and discussions. If we change the traditional approaches to tackling current challenges, it will prove effective in dealing with new and unpredicted events, especially in our region. Now, why does all of this matter? It matters because women have the right to participate in security discussions and shape the outcomes of decisions that will directly affect and impact their lives. I'll stop there. I thank you and I look forward to listening to the valuable inputs from colleagues in the region in particular. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador El Khadid, for your very thoughtful remarks. Uh, Mina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Ambassador Al Hadid. You've given us some great food for thought. And uh, thank you to the organizers of this session for having me moderate our illustrious panel coming up now. So, as we all know, this is an important topic, and that's why those of you who are here joining us know that. However, there are certain figures I wanted to add that are from UNIDIR um, and UN Women that are quite important to keep in mind. We know that women are underrepresented in international security and in peacemaking all too often. Something to keep in mind that when it comes to UNGA committees, the highest level of representation for women are in humanitarian committees, and even that's at 48%. All else is between 30 to 36%. And the Arab world particularly faces troubles because it has the least representation for women in security delegations. According to UNIDIR, it's 16.4% women representation in delegations. However, the highest is in Latin America, which is at 42.6%. And even though Latin America grouping is quite high, it's still less than 50%. So these are further numbers to say, we have a situation here that needs to be rectified. We have a great panel to tackle this. Um, all of them have illustrious careers, so I won't go into too much detail, but uh, very briefly, Ambassador Nabil Al Mullah from Kuwait became the first Arab female ambassador to the UN in 2003. In addition to serving as ambassador to the UN, she has served as ambassador to Kuwait, of Kuwait, sorry, in Zimbabwe, South Africa, and Austria. 
She was also the first woman from the Middle East and South Asia region to chair the Board of Governors of the International Atomic Energy Agency, 2002 to 2003. As I said, there's a much longer list to go, but I will uh, briefly move on to Ambassador Lana Nuseiba, Assistant Minister for Political Affairs and Permanent Representative of the United Arab Emirates at the UN in New York. Um, ambassador Lana was the first woman from the UAE to be appointed to the role of ambassador and permanent representative of the United Nations. 2017, she was elected as one of the vice presidents of the 72nd session of the General Assembly representing the Asia Pacific group from, of member states, alongside being named president of the UN Women Executive Board. Um, also has a long list that I will stop there. And, we have also with us Muna Ali Khalil, um, an international lawyer specialized in the field of international security and who has extensive uh, expertise in international security. She served at the UN Office for Legal Counsel, which advises the Security Council. She's also served in the Office of Legal Affairs of the IAEA, where she advised on nuclear security and counterterrorism. Again, the, the list is, is quite long, um, but importantly, Muna founded uh, MAK Law International, where she advises both governments and international organizations. So, um, Ambassador Nabila, I will come to you first um, to look at this question. And from your experience, you know, we've said that less than 20% of delegates from Arab League states uh, region are in disarmament forums, and the number drops to 16% when it is leading, or even less than actually 16% when it's leading delegations. So, we know there's low representation, um, but we want to know from you what it was like when you were named ambassador in 2003 and really breaking that important glass ceiling and how have things changed now? So over to you, Ambassador. Thank you, Mina. I, uh, thanks to UNIDER for organizing this uh, event. Um, uh, I would say that we came a long way, you know, during my time, I think I was more or less a loner in the field, the loner, whether it was in the whole diplomatic field as ambassador, wherever I want, uh, wherever I went, uh, in the IAEA, you know, we did not have any Arab women among the delegations except in ours. Uh, I was assisted at the time by the current, um, our ambassador to Canada, uh, Ambassador uh, Rimel Khalid. And I'm very proud that we were able to work together as a women's team, you know, from uh, the Middle East. In the United Nations as well, when I went there, it was the 60th anniversary of the UN. And I was telling my Arab colleagues, especially those who were from the founding members, the Arab founding members of the United Nations. And where are your women? You know, it takes little Kuwait that came in 1963. Uh, again, uh, the membership of the UN to be there as a first Arab woman while they, like Egypt, uh, uh, Jordan, Iraq, uh, Saudi Arabia, um, uh, uh, Lebanon, they have a longer tradition in their civil service, but their women were not there. I was very pleased to see later on to see that more women were also appointed as PEM uh, reps uh, at the UN. Even in lower levels, even as uh, lower than perm reps, you know, you hardly saw the women around. So it's a long way coming in. It's a, it's a lonely field, uh, but it's not lonely when you are concentrating on the issues that you have to tackle. And you have also the support of women from other regions. There is a camaraderie that exists uh, naturally with uh, the women from uh, even European Union, uh, Latin America, uh, uh, Africa, Asia, although they were in a minority there. So this is how it uh, went. I'm very proud to see that there are more women there, including in my own delegation, Kuwait's delegation uh, to the UN. Thank you, Mina. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ambassador Nabila. If I can ask you a quick follow-up question, and that is, you know, you said you saw this increasing and that there were these capable women and suddenly they're increasing. What do you think was the greatest driver for that increase? There is greater awareness. There is uh, primarily the issue of uh, the whole world wanting women to be encouraged to take part in uh, decision-making. But I must say that it's not only, it's not only the Arab world. You know, I'll look around and say, okay, well, I've never, I, until I 
attended the United Nations, I didn't see a single woman from the UK. You know, it was a male domain all the time. No Russian, no Chinese, you know. Um, the Americans, of course, they started, but mostly it were, they were political appointees. They were not career diplomats as such. Uh, so I always say, you know, let us not be too harsh on ourselves. Looking at other countries that have uh, a greater tradition of civil service there, even in, among our own. I mean, I look at Egypt and I say, you know, I'm really distressed that I don't see many Egyptian ambassadors in such fora in all my career, whether it is um, in Brussels, in Vienna, New York, I didn't see them in the field of arms control. It was the domain of men, you know, all the time. Uh, in the Arab League as well, you know. So the, there is this kind of, if I may borrow uh, uh, some Arabic e expressions, It was mostly about men monopolizing this uh, field in foreign policy. Public, the bureaucracies are convinced that men can do just good enough job to go ahead with. Thank you, Mina. Thank you so much. Um, so that takes us um, nicely to Ambassador Dana, because you know we know it is important to have representation of women, but I want to ask you why does um, women's meaningful participation matter in security? And not just at the decision-making level, Ambassador Nabila was saying that you know it's at the decision-making level, but also as you go further down, even though you have very capable voices within um, a lot of the civil service. So uh, Ambassador Dana, if I can turn to you, please. Thank you, Mina. It's so great to be here with you. Uh, and thanks to Unidir and UN Women for organizing this event and for the invitation to speak with such a fantastic group uh, of women ambassadors and leaders in their field from our part of the world. It's really refreshing, but it shouldn't be refreshing. It should be much more commonplace, which is, I think, one of the topics of the discussion today. Uh, and of course, you know, today, um, 21 years ago today, almost to the day, the Security Council, as Ambassador Dean has mentioned, uh, acknowledged for the first time uh, in Resolution 1325 that women are agents of change rather than victims in need of protection, which has been a little bit the prism through which uh, gender empowerment has been discussed for so many decades. And of course, although this is something that, as Ambassador Nabila said, something that we all know already from our own experience uh, of the world, I think the resolution finally created a formal mandate uh, for women's roles in conflict prevention, conflict resolution, and post-conflict setting. So in, in, in that sense, the UN is a very important place for setting the standards and the aspirations and the normative framework by which countries then aspire uh, to live up to. And I think, as other panelists have said, and Mina, as you said, there's an obvious moral rationale for uh, this for this inclusion um, but there's also a, a case in terms of outcomes there's also a case of answering the question what does it solve why does it matter uh, so and I think that case is answered very simply uh, by the fact that we know today that societies that cannot be stable uh, and their economies cannot thrive when we fail to include half of the population it's a simple fact uh, as ambassador Hadid pointed out in her opening remarks as well um, including women in the process uh, of peacemaking also has a positive impact on the durability of that peace. So there's another uh, selling point. So to put some numbers on it, and I feel sometimes that we feel we need to make a case for this uh, with this data, but I think it's important to illustrate. When women participate in peace processes, the resulting agreement we know now is 35% more likely to be durable than when women don't participate in it. Um, up to 15 years. Um, and in a study investigating 82 peace agreements in 42 different armed conflicts between 1989 and 2011, found that the peace agreements with women's signatories are also far more associated with durable peace outcomes than the peace agreements that did not have any female signatories to it. So I think that's a, a clear call uh, through the data for why women need to be involved in the peacemaking itself and in the decision making. Um, and next month, the international community will be celebrating, of course, the fifth anniversary of the Colombian peace agreement, which to date is an example of one of the most comprehensive agreements when it comes to inclusion of women's and girls' rights. And this inclusion can be traced back to the active advocacy of women from both negotiating parties. So we're getting more data, we're getting more case studies that help build the case of 
uh, all of us, I think, and the international community for why uh, this is the best investment from the peace and security continuum. And of course, there are a number of reasons. It's very difficult to identify one or two, but there are a number of reasons uh, for this impact uh, of women in decision-making roles in the security sector. Uh, I think, uh, you know, without generalizing, but both at the technical and at the leadership levels, there is clear benefit, there's clear net-net gain when women are included. Um, so there are some of the obvious societal ones. Women bring their own lived experience into their jobs. They improve the likelihood that other women's and girls' specific needs and rights are taken into account and respected, often as a case of, you know, unseen, unheard, unthought of. Uh, and so bringing their perspective directly into the negotiations from the outset brings that lived experience to bear. Um, they may, in some contexts and cultures, create a more comfortable channel for women to provide inputs on policy and implementation, and no uh, one's shoe fits all. Um, so they certainly, they inspire uh, women, uh, other women and girls as visible role models, and, and they encourage them, I think, when we see that uh, at the table to widen their career options actively contribute to their community's perspectives and prosperity. So we saw this in the UAE, we've heard it in other contexts from Kuwait, from Jordan, and we've definitely seen it in the UAE, this sort of um, inspiration that comes from having women in unusual uh, fields, fields that were before seen as the purview of only men. Uh, we in, in the UAE was our first female fighter pilot. Um, and for that matter, also our female nuclear scientists running the Middle East's first peaceful nuclear power program. Uh, the woman who is overseeing our Mars program and can orbit up into Mars the first time that has happened in the Arab world. Um, so I think these become role models and inspiration points for girls and women around the Middle East, um, and, and that can lift all of us up together. In Liberia, we've seen that the first all-female peacekeeping unit um, has created another dynamic shift for inclusion. Women peacekeepers uh, were more aware on the ground of what was happening or could happen to women and girls, and they also helped to reset society's views on what women are capable of. So as UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres rightfully reminded us during his remarks at the open debate uh, last week on women, peace and security, conflict prevention and disarmament have been at the core of the women's movement for peace for more than a century. Uh, and I think inclusion is especially important in the Middle East and North Africa right now because of the numbers, unfortunately, and the severity of the conflicts. We do occupy uh, a slightly larger part of the Security Council agenda here in New York than I would like to see. Uh, and we're faced with these complex peace processes, as well as significant development losses that must be reversed if we are to ensure uh, stability and development for all of the countries that we care about and, and globally. And that is before, um, of course, getting to the severe setbacks of COVID-19, the impacts of climate change. Um, all of this makes uh, recovery an even bigger lift. Um, so it's not just important, but essential that we make a major investment in women in the MENA and global security sectors over the next few years. I think we should have long surpassed the stage of having to justify a woman's seat at the table. Um, and women's participation in peace and security is so often referred to um, uh, as something that we still need to debate. It's not so much uh, why should it be there, it's how do we implement it? How do we make it happen? I think should be the conversation uh, that we are having in these discussions today. And so just quickly, I'd like to highlight three interventions uh, for the consideration of the panel and the audience that we think from our experience at home and at the UN could speed up gender sensitization in the security sector uh, and give our next WPS anniversaries even more to, ce to celebrate if we focus on these tangible outcomes. So first, on women's full and equal and meaningful participation in peace and recovery processes. We shouldn't shy away from quotas in my view, they do work. Um, and that said, there's no question that certain peace processes are harder to crack on women's representation and leadership than others. But rather than giving up, we have compelling examples from the UN where they've innovated around hurdles. Certain peace envoys and senior officials have set up women's advisory bodies or held mass consultations, including online. And, and these are more concrete ways to raise women's voices, include them. Uh, and as member states, I think that responsibility lies on us. We need to ensure that every peace and recovery process has a clear cut gender inclusion mechanism when it's defined, when it's debated and set by the Security Council. Second, UN agencies themselves can make gender a stronger part of their core evaluation metrics. And so I'm really optimistic uh, that UN women, and really I applaud the uh, appointment selection of Ambassador Seema Bahous, 
uh, a role model in the Arab region to head this agency. But I think under her leadership and with the fantastic team there, UN Women can continue to build momentum here as an advocate across the UN system for these tangible, deliverable outcomes. So every UN actor in the security space should have requirements to have gender balanced teams, gender balanced consultations with conflict stakeholders and gender advisor review of programming among other measures. And I think we can think of several others. And to ensure there is accountability on these metrics, I think performance against them needs to be incorporated into staff evaluations affecting pay and promotion to show that we think it really matters. And third, I think it's high time that we have Arab women, more Arab women as SRSGs and special peace envoys. Of the 23 senior officials in the field, only eight are women, and none of them are from our region, despite it being one of the most conflict affected regions in the world. So a great opportunity to rectify this representation gap is uh, by ensuring female MENA leaders replace officials who retire or re are reassigned. And it, it's not just symbolic, it's really also substantive. And I think we all have a collective responsibility to live up to what we have promised to women and girls in all of these groundbreaking declarations and resolutions of the last two decades and more. And we shouldn't frame this work as a burden, which is too often how the gender discussion is framed around. And there are few investments um, that have such high returns. So we should frame it in the economic way as well. McKinsey estimates that even partial progress on gender equality with many of the reforms being cost-free, could generate $12 trillion of global GDP by 2025. Who would not want to see a generation of $12 trillion to global GDP by 2025? So as my team and I are currently preparing for the UAE's term on the Security Council beginning January 2022, uh, we're pursuing a results-oriented approach to this discussion with the objective of moving gender equality out of its silo and into all discussions relevant to peace and security. So it's, we think in our view, and I think the view of all the panelists today, it's the right move for women. It's also the right move for men, and it's the right move for the economy and for peace. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Lana. That's um, great and some meaningful and tangible um, possibilities for how we can increase gender representation. And really that takes us nicely over um, to Muna, because I wanted to ask you, in your experience, what you've seen actually has worked in increasing women's participation um, from the MENA region, be it in peace operations or more broadly in this um, agenda. So over to you, Muna. Thank you, Mina, and thank you to the fellow panelists and the keynote speaker. Uh, I'm a fan of all of the above, and. Uh, I'd like to count myself as a friend of many of them. Um, I am inspired by them, but also take their uh, their warning that while great progress has been made, that there's a tremendous amount of work to be done. We've had a year, maybe a year and a half of wake up calls. The wake up call of the pandemic was not the only one. There was the extreme weather events waking us up to the existential threat of the climate change wake up call. But the anniversary, the 20th anniversary of 1325 was itself a wake up call. Again, progress had been made, but, but woefully little progress, unfortunately. After tremendous effort, tremendous resources, tremendous commitment, um, we have very little to show for it, I think. We have less than 20% of the peacekeepers are women, less than 15 of the peace negotiators are women, and less than 10% of the signatories of major peace agreements are women. So as, as Nabila rightly noted, it's not just in the Arab world where progress is lacking, it's also at the global level. Um, and unfortunately, while we are uh, still a smaller fraction of the leaders and the peacekeepers and the peacemakers, we are still the plurality of the victims. Um, and while 1325 is right to reorient the role of women in peacekeeping and peacemaking, not as just victims and survivors, but rather as leaders and advocates for peace and justice and, and those who are uh, essential to the uh, conclusion of peace agreements and uh, peace operations, uh, we cannot lose sight of the Darfuri women in Sudan or the Yazidi women in Iraq or the Myanmar women, uh, uh, the Rohingya women in Myanmar, for they're not only suffering the vagaries of war that men and women and uh, all humanity suffers, but they are special victims of rape and other sexual gender-based violence. They are also those that suffer the greatest impact of the socioeconomic depravities and vagaries of war and of, of, of marginalization in general. So let us 
see that fuller picture and then contextualize where uh, the Arab world is, is uh, woefully behind, but, but we're all behind. The Scandinavian countries like Iceland, Norway, Finland, Sweden lead the world, but even there, the gender gap has not, has not, been, uh, has not been fixed. So maybe a little bit of good news after all of this bad news is, is welcome. Um, we do have 29 female heads of state worldwide. And one would think that the majority would be, um, you know, there'd be a more of an imbalance of proportionality of where those women come from, but it's actually quite geographically diverse. We have eight from Western Europe, seven from Eastern Europe, five from Latin America and the Caribbean, five from Africa, four from Asia, but none from the Arab world. Um, we have seen, I think, a tremendous rise. Um, and for some reason, Arab women ambassadors tend to be more visible, I think, because it's more surprising. But we do have a, uh, I would say, a powerful collection uh, of, of, of superstars. We've seen them heading you know, the UN 75 declaration. We've seen them heading uh, the, the chairman, two chairmen on this panel alone of the Board of Governors, uh, one of the first and one of the most recent. Um, so we, we, we have made great strides. Um, unfortunately, as, as many of my co-panelists have mentioned, the pandemic has set us back um, in the year of decadive action uh, for sustainable development. We're actually further behind. We've made losses, we've suffered losses, we're, uh, we've lost some gains. Um, so we, it's, it's no time to be complacent and, or celebrating many of these anniversaries. It's time to redouble our, our efforts globally as well as locally. But I am optimistic. The, the girls are the ones that give me the most optimism. Uh, we've seen Nadia Murad, a Yazidi woman who suffered great um, untold uh, suffering at the hands of ISIS um, emerge as a Nobel Peace Prize winner, but also as an extremely effective advocate for justice and criminal accountability as a means to peace. We have seen Malala, who was shot in the head merely for wanting an education. Um, become an advocate for girls' education and for women's rights uh, on a broader socioeconomic level. So we have every reason to be optimistic. A recent report by Resdal, a security defense network of Latin uh, America, has highlighted some, some interesting facts for us that I'm happy to summarize briefly just to give us a sense of uh, grounding as we try to launch into greater success and greater progress. But in that report, they've identified Egypt, Jordan, and Morocco as the three main Arab contributors to peacekeeping. And while Arab women are uh, less likely to serve as contingents, they're less than half of the average, they are a higher concentration of women among staff and experts in, in peacekeeping missions, twice the average. Uh, most countries in the MENA region are recruiting women increasingly and, and almost with a concerted um, commitment to not just do it, but to be seen to be doing it. Um, and there is this concerted effort, but primarily in the field of civil service. Uh, we see many doctors, many diplomats, many journalists, many um, ambassadors, but we don't see that many force commanders. We don't see that many soldiers. We don't see that many police officers. Um, progress is being made. There is, as I said, a concerted effort to fill the ranks across the board and armed forces and police forces. Um, and there is a recognition of the value, the added value as uh, Ambassador Lina and Ambassador uh, Lana both have, have mentioned in, in their respective countries making tremendous strides. Egypt, for instance, has uh, contributed we did over 30,000 30, peacekeepers through over 37 UN missions in 24 countries, um, but unfortunately, very few women. Uh, Tunisia is, has a better record. 5% of its armed forces are women, uh, including command officers, 40 military pilots and 40 naval officers. They have also taken the lead in combating terrorism um, alongside their male colleagues. Jordan, uh, is, a, is a case study of success as well, where we see a higher percentage of women, um, uh, almost annually, a visible tangible increase, um, dating back to the early 2000s, it recruited as officers and given senior command positions in the field, military intelligence, military courts um, are, are staffed with, uh, with increasingly uh, uh, greater, greater percentages of women. 
including uh, 863 troops to the UN peacekeeping missions, and maybe one of the first, if not the first Arab country to reach the, the uh, female officer quota in the peacekeeping missions. So Algeria also uh, has, has had a very advanced uh, participation of women dating back to the resistance to the French colonial era, where women played a significant role, not only in war, but also in peace. Um, and uh, uh, were politically empowered by the constitution at the time and various uh, decrees and ordinances giving equal status and equal opportunity to women um, for, for, for decades uh, ahead of, of, of other Arab countries. Um, but nonetheless, they're still excluded from combat positions from force commander, military and, and, and uh, non-civil uh, oriented staff positions. So why, why is that? Why do we see that? There's of course the cultural, possibly the religious, but there's also a, I think an overly narrow understanding of what peace and security is. It isn't just diplomats and, and soldiers. It isn't just political leaders and military leaders. It is, as we see from the spectrum of women here and their backgrounds, journalists and lawyers and human rights monitors and safeguards inspectors and uh, intelligence officers and humanitarian actors, the interdependence of peace and security, human rights and sustainable development, I think opens huge channels and huge opportunities for women to make a difference, Arab women in particular, um, from the doctor to the journalist, from the human rights activist to the lawyer, all women have uh, a much broader uh, path to peace and security uh, uh, and a more sort of diversified um, uh, interdependence of our skills and, and skill sets. I've had the pleasure of training several Arab governments for preparation for their seat on the Security Council and other important bodies of the UN. And without a doubt, not only are half the people on the, in the training course have been women, we have parity within the training programs, but the superstars are usually women. Partially because they have to, you know, they're accustomed to having to prove themselves to be, you know, to be better in order to be treated as equal. That's, that's something that, that is often the, the burden of a woman that she has to work harder just to be visible sometimes and to be chosen to rise through the ranks. But they do rise and they are, their star is shining and their star is rising. So that again, you know, allows me to end on a very uh, positive note that we have the talent, we have the opportunity, we have the mandate and as, uh, Ambassador Lana said, we have the imperative. It's a question of life and death, not only for the region, but for the broader globe, given all the wake up calls that we are facing. Thank you very much, Mona, um, both in terms of giving us some positive news in, in addition to all the challenges we face, but also the importance of this particular issue. Ambassador Nabila, I know you wanted to um, comment, so please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to add to what Muna was uh, saying because I'm very proud and uh, satisfied that at least also we made strides in that aspect of inclu women inclusion in the, uh, uh, in the military only three days ago or four days ago. It was announced that women are welcome to enlist in the army and the navy and whatnot. So it's a great step forward. Saying that, of course, you know, I want to comment on this general trend of how can we encourage the women to enlist in these fields, whether it's peacekeeping, whatever it is, you know, uh, arms control negotiations. It's uh, uh, emulating, you know, one, one country looks at the other and they try to sort of best themselves compared to the other. I think it's a very interesting, healthy, kind of competition when you see that and more so when it exists among the, uh, 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 the, the, the Arab uh, countries. Uh, the other uh, thing that I want to emphasize when I said, you know, it was the role of the, the, it's the effect of the international organizations making countries aware of uh, the necessity of including women in the different um, aspects of life, whether it's in the peacekeeping, arms control, etc., etc. Also, it is the role of the UN within the organizations. I, during my term all over the, from whether it was the uh, UN agencies in Vienna, 
or previously at uh, headquarters in New York, there is some kind of um, marginalization of the Arab woman in the midst, especially Arab women who did not have the backing of their, uh, their states. Some of them are enlisted there, they work there, but they need to be encouraged and nurtured. The lack of support by their own governments should not be a hindrance. I think it's the organization itself that has to support these Arab women, you know, uh, just because perhaps they are dual citizens, they, they just live um, outside of their own home countries. Attention should be given to these workers, you know, and I really think that they are good workers. I knew a couple of them and I thought it was really um, an eye opener. Um, uh, uh, Lena, I think it was Lena who mentioned the fact that uh, the Jordanian uh, uh, inspector being there in the IAA. Can you imagine, this is way back. In 2002, I was shocked, shocked to see that among the inspectors that came back from Pyongyang after North Korea um, evicted the, uh, 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 the inspectors, one of them was an Egyptian woman. Uh, to my, I was, I was truly surprised. I didn't expect that an Egyptian, a Sheba, whatever it is, was there. So I asked to see her. I, I was intrigued that in 2002, we had an Arab that would go to North Korea, you know. These kind of fields should be open to women all over the place and slowly and encourage them. We should encourage young persons, you know, and, and convince them, okay, fine, you might not reach the top. You might not be a leader, not have a label or something like that, but you will find a niche, something that will satisfy your mind and soul and working together with others from the third world, the developed world or whatnot. But let's open up the way for them. I'll tell you one, one thing if I still have time. Uh, one of the things that I appreciated in my upbringing is that one of my professors opened the door for me to join Pagwash. I was still in university. For me, I was like, wow, you know, to go to such an institution and discuss armaments and disarmament and things like that. Encourage them, invite them to institutions to talk, to listen and things like that. Because only by practice will they develop their, their, uh, their whole being into the field. Thank you. Uh, I think the point about role models that we've heard being repeated here um, is such an important one. And all of you are role models and have, you know, really given um, Arab youth, men and women, um, role models of success, but also the roles they can play on the international stage, serving their countries, but also um, international stage. So we have quite a few questions coming in, and I know we've got limited time, unfortunately. So I, I want to pose the first question that's coming um, to us from the part uh, from the audience, but also Ambassador Dina Hadid, I will ask you as we wrap up to give us your thoughts. But first, the question from um, the audience, which is, how do you empower men in the Middle East to also be champions for women because this is important women do support women but we also need um men to support women and also to see the benefit of that so um and this is open to the panel i'm not sure who would like to take a stab at this one i think that's an excellent excellent point and it's very important to to uh to focus on the, the male perspective. We don't want to have a reverse discrimination policy as we go forward in the future. There's three, three things that I, uh, that I would kind of bring to the table on this issue. Number one, you know, we focus on the girls, but it's as important for boys to see as normal, successful women thriving in all fields. Uh, in order for, for that normalization to occur, it's important that we open the eyes of our boys as much as we open the eyes of our girls. Second, um, I mean, I pay tribute to my father uh, and all men. In order to have empowered women, we need enlightened men. It was my father more than my mother, I have to confess, who encouraged me to be a self-sufficient professional who to, to advance my, my education, to advance my career. My mother, of course, supported that, but it wasn't as important to her as it was to my dad. 
So we need to encourage the enlightened men who empower uh, us as women. And third and uh, most important, we need to empower each other. Um, as uh, Nabila has said, we need to network, we need to mentor, we mean, need to champion, we need to uphold those examples and those heroes. But on the negative side, and I think this is as important, and we've seen this in right-wing extremism as much as we've seen it in, in Islamic jihadism, men who are threatened by successful women become dangerous, become marginalized. They start to see the success of women, the advancement of women as a sign of, the, of their loss, of their marginalization, of their disenfranchisement. That is part of the radicalization process and the misogyny that accompanies that is a danger to our region as it is a danger to the globe. We, they have that in common. These extremists, these uh, right-wing violent extremists also possess a certain message of, of misogyny where they see that women are taking opportunity from them. Um, their sense of superiority may derive from race, but it also derives from gender. And as women succeed, these men become radicalized. So it's very important that education campaigns also direct themselves to the radicalization aspect of the advancement of women. Our success is seen as their failure and they see it that way. And that makes them a danger to us and to their communities. Thank you very much. Um, Ambassador Lani, you wanted to respond also. Just building on, on the points that have just been made that I think were really powerful. I think um, Ambassador Nabila spoke essentially about mentorship and the role that women in positions uh, in their fields have in bringing up other women uh, to, uh, to look for professions and fields that are out of the traditional norm. So I think the role of mentorship, carving space out in your calendar and saying, right, who are the two or three women I will make myself available for in this field? And men, of course, but I think who are the two or three women I make myself available for in this in this um, in this very busy calendar to uh, to mentor. I think the second thing was around, um, of course, men have to be uh, equal partners in seeing this as a win win uh, for them as well. I think that's essential. It's not just important or nice to have. It's essential. Uh, and I think we all can speak to men who have empowered us and pushed us forward in many ways as much as the women. In fact, it's often the men who give you uh, that first opportunity uh, that you are trying to seek because they're the ones in charge of the decisions. Um, so I think that is incredibly important. Um, you know, I remember when the UN launched an initiative, He for She, uh, and uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed uh, and Nahan, our foreign minister, was the first person to sign up and say, I'll be, I'd will be, i love to be a He for She, and was really proudly wearing his badge, that General Assembly, um, and, you know, felt that he was you know, our first feminist. Uh, and I think that if more men do that, if more men find it um, not embarrassing, but something to be proud of, to be a feminist, to be at the forefront of uh, gender equality, I think that will actually go a long way. And we all, as uh, Ambassador Nabila said and others, set examples for each other in the region and then and then move it forward, do better than the next the next time. Um, on There was an interesting comment from the um, previous intervention by Mona about um, the, the pipeline. And I think we have so much work to do on the pipeline. We often hear, even from within the UN system, we'd like to appoint more women cadets, more women peacekeepers, more this, more that, but we just, we, we advertise and there aren't any. Um, and, you know, it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a short-term answer. And I think we need to all be working on the midterm and the longer term solutions for increasing uh, the scope of the pipeline. So in the UAE, we have the Sheikha Fatima bin Mubarak uh, peace and security center in partnership with uh, UN women and essentially we're training women cadets we're on our third cohort of graduates um, uh, who are going through the training academy and essentially we're taking women from Asia from Africa from the Middle East who've applied to this they're being paid in order to go through this training they're from their military uh, respective military uh, sectors in their country and they are, in my view, a future pipeline. They're networking with each other. They're net networking with the UN. They're looking for opportunities in the UN system or back in their own countries. And they're getting top-notch training in the UAE to the point of cultural sensitivities. They're also getting it in an environment that perhaps is uh, comfortable for them. And we have to create those environments as well. So I think those are the kinds of things that we need to do to create better mechanisms for enabling, empowering, and making that pipeline really full of great applicants. Thank you very much. So I apologize. We've only got 
three and a half minutes to get through two more questions and also give um, an opportunity to Ambassador Al Hadid. So please try to keep your responses to the next two questions as tight as you can. So the next one is what role can women play in religious based diplomacy and conflict resolution in the Middle East? Um, and so this idea of women's empowerment and religious initiatives can work, can they work hand in hand? Um, so with that, I'd like to um, ask Ambassador Nabila, but also Ambassador Lina, I'll come to you because I know Jordan has, has played a role in that. So Ambassador Nabila, if you can respond to that, please. As much as we would like to say, you know, I find difficulty in dealing with the religious establishments. They are so entrenched all over the place. I'm not talking only about our region, whether it's Sunni or Shia, I'm talking even about the West, where the religious sentiment is very strong there, you know. I don't mm. want to be a, a, a pessimistic uh, a view of uh, what is happening in the world, but uh, I don't know what we can do, you know. Honestly, I can't prescribe anything except that let us keep an open mind at every opportunity where we can make inroads into the minds of youth in particular. For me, youth are the most important element in this aspect. If we can uh, energize them and mobilize them, they are the prime movers. We have seen that with, the, uh, uh, with climate change. They are the power behind that has the pr pressure on decision makers and whatnot. So I think our, our focus should be on the younger generation and try to enlist them for, with ideas and to encourage them, to encourage them in particular, in particular, I say that to the benefit of even my students at the university, I say you have to persevere, you have to be resilient and you have a little bit humble because what you know is not what is there in the world to know and you will have to educate yourself and uh, attach yourself to others who have preceded you and to work together not necessarily within the small community but community of nations thank you thank you very much ambassador Al Hadid. if i can ask you also to respond to that question and then um, any thoughts you may have had from our conversation as we come to a close soon Thank you so much, Mina. Just very quickly to concur with everything that's being said and also to link that question to the previous one as well. How do we engage uh, male, uh, the males in, in this discussion in particular? And since we're talking about the, our region, I think the education and the involvement of male religious leaders is so crucial in our part of the world to change the messaging and to make sure that their messaging is more about the inclusion, but that can only be done through education. And when it comes to role models in particular, you know, everybody tells me, uh, you must be such a great role model for your daughter. I always say, you know, I need to be just as much as a role model for my son as for my daughter, because it's all about the, the education, it's all about the awareness, it's all about, uh, as, as Muna also rightly said, lessening or, or, or making the threat to men minimal and to understand that we all benefit in this. I think Ambassador Lana uh, so eloquently um, discussed this as well. But it basically, it's a comprehensive approach to a serious problem. We have to tackle all the issues. It's not one issue and not the other. Everything's interlinked and everything can be so effective in moving our communities forward. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, so my last question to all of our um, panelists and Ambassador Al Hadid before we close this part of today's session is what one, only one piece of advice would you give to either girls or women thinking about coming into the security field? So uh, Mona, I will start with you and then um, go to the rest of our panelists. Mona, over to you, but please briefly. Uh, two things. I think the role models is an important one, but we also need to look back at history and Islamic history. We have role models in Islamic history. The Prophet Wasallam's boss was a woman. Khadija, before it was his wife, she was his boss in the caravan uh, market marketplace. Also, his closest advisor was a woman, one of his wives. Um, so we do have role models within Islam that we can alter the conversation on the religious side. But we ourselves have a duty to empower those who come after us. We were empowered. We need to reach back and, and lift up the, the next generation. And I'm very optimistic as the talent and the ambition is, is 
self-evidently and very, very tangibly available to us. Thank you so much. Ambassador Lana, your one piece of advice? Be really good at what you do. Be specialized, read around the subject, go to seminars, go to lectures, meet interesting people. And if you don't love what you do, if you don't wake up every day within your chosen field and feel inspired by it, uh, and it's about a job title, then you're in the wrong profession. So be in it for the right reasons. Be good at what you do. Uh, I think the rest will come. Have patience and humility and the rest will come. Thank you so much. And Ambassador Nabila. I would say Dito <laughs> in particular, but it's not only for this, for the field of arms control and disarmament. For youngsters, I always say, be happy in what you are doing. Otherwise you'll be miserable the rest of your life. It is not an end. It's not an objective to be a negotiator, or peacekeeper or whatnot. It has to be also in your blood that you, it grows on you. So if you are not so sure of that, you attach yourself to a mission, attach yourself to the UN, if it can be arranged or something, and try to learn the ropes. But more than that, and as um, uh, the others have said, read, you know, because this is one important aspect that I face, it's, you know, that bothers me about the younger generation nowadays, you know, they don't read. It's not enough that you hear and uh, whatnot, you know, or, you know, by experience. Uh, read the Marseille, read the history of peacekeeping. How many, how many people realize that peacekeeping was not even envisioned in the chapter of the United Nations, you know? I always challenge this to say, find me, how did it develop all through the years, things like that. So encourage them to research, encourage them to question, encourage them to know that they are in the right spot. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And Ambassador Al Hadid, your one piece of advice. Um, thank you very briefly on top of everything everyone else has said, persevere. It's not personal. The obstacles are not personal. And um, uh, keep, stay focused. Stay focused on your end goal. I think that is so important and do not listen to the noise. I think that's, that's my advice. Thank you very much. Thank you to our great panel. So um, I would like to thank our panel. If you're sitting in a room, we'd all be clapping for you. So I will clap for you here. And I will give the floor to Deputy Executive Director of UN Women, Anita Bahita. Please, over to you. And thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. And let me start by just saying really a, a very warm and heartfelt thanks to our distinguished panelists, Ambassador Lina Al-Hadid, Ambassador Lana Nusebe, Ambassador Nabila Al-Mullah, Mona Al-Khalil, and I'd also like to uh, sincerely congratulate Dr. Robin Geis on your recent appointment uh, as the director of UNIDIR. Um, I'd like to just end this uh, fascinating conversation, which I was privileged enough to catch uh, a few snippets of, by just reminding us all of the important role that the women's movement has played at the forefront of disarmament efforts at various levels. Women have shed light on the gendered impacts of the use and trade of weapons, such as use for sexual and gender-based violence and conflict, and of course, exacerbation of existing social and gender inequalities broadly. This is why, this is among the reasons why in 2020, the Secretary General set the reduction of global military expenditure is one of the five goals for the next 10 years of women, peace and security. But when you look at the data, it is actually quite disturbing because while the world was grappling with the COVID crisis and the overall global economy was actually shrinking and shrank by 3.3% last year, there was an increase in military expenditure of 2.6% at a time when we are clearly seeing that security cannot, security concerns cannot be met by defense expenditure alone because security today has different meanings and security includes health security and economic security. So the old way of thinking about security is still translating into increased military expenditures. We have seen that women have been the first responders to communities that are working to 
build peace and to repair the physical, social, economic, and psychological damage of conflict and COVID uh, to rebuild peaceful communities. So not only have we witnessed the very successful stewardship of the response to the pandemic in many countries which have been led by women leaders, but at a more globe, at a more community level and at a grassroots level, we have seen the rapid mobilization of women's groups in Iraq, in Libya, in Palestine, Syria, Yemen, and other countries who have echoed the Secretary General's call for a global ceasefire. As you all probably know, UN Women contributes to the Secretary General's report on illicit trade in small arms and light weapons. We also contribute to the United Nations Disarmament Yearbook, and within the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, we have contributed to the training manual on small arms and light weapons. We have collaborated with UNODC in global online events for presentations and trainings on the interlinkages between small arms and light weapons and violence against women across the breadth of the humanitarian peace and development nexus. And most importantly, I want to underscore how UN women by helping civil society organizations who have repeatedly and for decades called for disarmament, arms control, and the shifting of military expenditure to social investment, UN Women is contributing to this very important dialogue. And this was recognized when the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons uh, received the Nobel Prize in 2017. So finally, just to wrap up, I, I do want to underscore that despite the centrality of weapons to armed conflict, the women peace and security agenda can probably do more to engage with the field of disarmament and arms control, particularly at the multilateral level. There have been 11 Security Council resolutions on WPS but very few of them actually have references to arms control and disarmament. And multilateral meetings on women, peace and security actually don't often address the um, um, governance of weapons. And so we know that the national implementation of the agenda uh, actually presents a more encouraging picture because national action plans have included arms control and disarmament, in particular uh, regarding small arms and light weapons, and to a lesser degree, some action. And this trend has become quite noticeable since 2015, which suggests that there is actually a new momentum in many countries for integrating arms control into WPS policies and implementation. And initiatives in the field of arms control and disarmament to improve women's participation actually represents an opportunity for us to strengthen convergence between these policy areas. We know there have been a number of concrete steps in recent years to increase the participation of women in disarmament diplomacy, including the creation of informal gender working groups in landmine and cluster munition review conferences, the establishment of fellowship to sponsor women diplomats who participate in cybersecurity negotiations, the provision of a sexual harassment helpline and email address during the 2019 preparatory committee work for the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference and other such instances. Um, however, because all of these share the broader goal of reducing armed violence, we must work together to strengthen these synergies. And we must work together to ensure that women who have repeatedly and routinely been sidelined and underrepresented in political processes, including disarmament negotiations, actually have a seat at the table. And I just here want to refer to the 2019 uh, UNIDIR study, which found that 20 years after 1325, gender inequality continues to persist in disarmament dis diplomacy with women comprising just 32% of participants in disarmament related meetings over the last 40 years. This must change. 
And we know that in Arab states, for instance, women have often been largely excluded both from peace processes and dialogues on missiles and nuclear proliferation. And it is therefore very important that we work as was being discussed previously to increase the level of women's participation. Let me end by saying it is absolutely vital that the international community substantially increase efforts towards the full implementation of the WPS agenda if we're going to want to effectively thwart global arms proliferation, prevent conflict, and build peaceful and inclusive societies, increased participation of women is a sine qua non. And states should therefore raise awareness of the relevance of gender equality, inequality to arms control, to non-proliferation and disarmament measures in the region, but also globally, the region is not exceptional in this respect, all regions of the world need to improve their um, um, performance in this regard. And we need to get the multilateral system to recognize that uh, women have a really important role to play in disarmament by promoting expertise in weapons control and increasing, this is really important, increasing the gender balance in decision making. We must also speak out loudly about the fact that during the time when the world was grappling with the effects of the pandemic, military expenditures were actually rising. That means something else was not being prioritized because the pie is discrete and spending more on one issue means you're spending less on something else. So we have to encourage greater investment in social infrastructure and services mm -hmm. that buttress the full range of human security. Nationalize the arms trade treaty and related treaties so that you bridge the gender and disarmament framework gaps from the local to the global level and member states should ensure complementarity of the respective peace and security frameworks within the ATT including national action plans on 1325 and SDG reporting. It is only by doing things like this and taking these actions that we can expect to effectively tackle arms proliferation and achieve durable peace. Thank you so much. And um, I once again want to end by saying a very big thank you to all of our distinguished panelists and participants in uh, today's event. Thank you so much for your thoughts and for really, you know, putting a spotlight on some of the issues that were raised, but it, fleshing them out for us. And of course, the role of UN women on championing these and many other causes. Um, and now it gives me great pleasure to hand over to the director of UNIDIR, uh, Dr. Robin Geese, over to you. And thank you all for uh, both your participation and those who have um, attended and uh, continued with us throughout this conversation. Thank you. Shukran Jazilian, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, yes, first of all, a warm thank you to all our distinguished uh, panelists for this very inspiring discussion today. So gender norms vary across the world as do international security, disarmament concerns and, and other security priorities. And that's exactly why it's so important for us to examine these issues in a context specific manner. And UNIDIR regularly carries out regional and sub-regional discussions because they allow for deeper understanding of the problems that people are facing, as well as the opportunities to overcome it. It's against this background that today's event was organized with the clear objective of shedding light on the prospects of greater participation and agency of women in international security decision-making in the Middle East. We were very fortunate to hear from a diverse group of inspiring women whose eminent achievements demonstrate the contribution that Arab women and women from the Middle East more broadly make to the field of international security and disarmament. Their knowledge and their experience in these areas are also a reminder of what we have to lose when we exclude women from policy discussions and decision making. And I don't think we can afford to do that. We also heard about obstacles on the way to equality, but these are by no means unresolvable. By implementing targeted policies, building political support, transforming organizational cultures and mindsets, 
and valuing diversity, we can certainly create a more equal and a more secure world. I would like to emphasize the last point about diversity in particular. When the same people talk about the same issues all the time, they tend to come to the same conclusions and the same solutions, solutions over and over again. So in this regard, both regional and gender diversity can be an important means to enhance diversity of thought and which ultimately leads to a better and more sustainable outcome in the field of security. And I think this is true in all other policy domains just as well. I strongly believe that creating a gender equal culture is ultimately about assigning value to diversity and change. And women and men, as we heard, need to be on board for this to happen. Here, I would like to highlight the work of the International Gender Champions Network and more specifically, the Gender Champion Disarmament Impact Group. These are leadership networks comprising individuals committed to advance gender equality in their organization and in their programmatic work. UNIDIR as an organization is involved in these initiatives and so am I. Ultimately, we hope that efforts to advance gender equality in international security will also encourage new at more diverse perspectives. As we continue to work towards these goals, we're very privileged to have a range of partners joining forces with us. And in this regard, I would like to extend a very warm thank you once again to all our panelists who joined us today, as well as of course to UN Women for the collaboration on this joint event. Finally, I would like to thank everyone who joined us today, all of you who participated in the discussion. Thank you very much. I wish everyone a good day, a good afternoon, a good evening, depending on where you are. And with this, I'm handing back over to Ken. Thank you, Robin. Uh, and I would like uh, to again thank everyone. At the end of the, this really important event, I want to thank our distinguished speakers, guests, and I want to wish all of you a good day. Uh, I want to remind you that the event is going to be, is recorded and is going to be posted uh, online. So I will encourage you to check what uh, was said and implement some of those ideas. Uh, I think that will empower all of us to have a better uh, decision makings, negotiations, and a better world. So with that, thank you, everyone.